Hello and welcome to Telestor English. I am Estefania Bravo. This is from the South. A 5.8 magnitude earthquake has hit the island nation of Puerto Rico, causing power cuts and severe damage to homes. The quake, which struck at 6.32 local time, was followed by minor tremors, including a magnitude 5.1 at 10.52 local time. Authorities said two of the island's main power stations have been affected, resulting in power outages in many areas. So no casualties have been reported so far. Nobody. Nobody slept here. None of us here were sleeping. We were constantly at down in the streets because at 2 a.m., 1 a.m., the shaking was very strong and everyone would come out. And there was uncertainty about something worse coming. Yeah, that's it. The newly elected president of the National Assembly of Venezuela says he will use his term in office to turn the National Assembly into an institution that serves the interests of Venezuelan people, unlike in the past where it has, where, where it has been to destabilize the country. On Tuesday, we have convened the first ordinary meeting of the National Assembly for 2020. And later on Monday, we will disclose the agenda for that meeting, when us as new leaders and all other lawmakers will come back together to work for the people, to make this institution into a useful mechanism for the people of Venezuela. Venezuela's National Assembly has chosen Luis Parra as its new president during its first session of the year. The vote is a, ma is a major defeat for U.S.-backed opposition figure Juan Guaido. Our correspondent, Madeline Garcia, followed the events that led to this change. These images sum up how fragmented the Venezuelan opposition is. It's the moment when Juan Guaido's loyal representatives try to prevent the start of the session to elect a new leadership for the National Assembly. This all started early in the day, when many opposition figures rebelled against Guaido and presented their own candidate for assembly president. They avoid any debate and try to silence us by any means necessary. Today they want to blackmail us with their lack of morals. They say that if we don't support Guaido, we are headed for catastrophe that we will lose international support. Meanwhile, Chavista lawmakers made their position clear. If the opposition's alternative is willing to work towards bringing this institution back into the fold, then they have our vote. The lawmakers that didn't vote for Guaido were threatened by the United States. We are a sovereign nation that has a parliament recognized by more than 150 countries. Today, as in most of the parliaments around the world, we have come together to return to normality. This is how opposition lawmakers arrived to the assembly. After 10 a.m., lawmakers were inside the chamber, waiting for Juan Guaido. There were 150, including those who supported him. The National Guard had a list of lawmakers who weren't allowed to pass as they had been invalidated for their involvement in April scoop at them. The problem wasn't just Juan Guaido, but the group that was accompanying him. All of us or none of us was their strategy. Guaido moved through the security checkpoints, holding on to the hope of being re-elected. <laughs> Curiously, earlier in the day, Alberto Federico Ravel, Juan Guaido's chief of communications, planted the seat of a parliamentary coup. Their actions were weaving together that script. As things stand, we cannot begin the session. This is a parliamentary coup orchestrated by the armed forces. But the issue still wasn't Juan Guaido, but the group of people he insisted on bringing through. At the last security checkpoint, one of these lawmakers, Gilberto Soho, didn't present his credentials. The guards looked for him in the list. While this was taking place, Guaido could have gone in, but he refused. No, we are not going to pass until this is verified. While this happened outside, two hours had passed. An opposition lawmaker proposed that the session begin without Guaido, as the assembly's own rules allow for this. But clashes started after his microphone was taken away. <laughs> 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 
why those people immediately jump up in protest. They nearly punched the lawmaker who made the proposal. They took over the room where the assembly's audio console is located. And even though they tried to have the microphone cut, the session was started in Guaidó's absence. He was the only person missing, in compliance with the National Assembly's rules. In a situation such as this, the oldest sitting lawmaker takes over and leads the debate. A provisional secretary was named, who read the day's only item, the election of a new leadership. Loudly, lawmakers supported an alternative to Juan Guaidó. After the vote, the new leadership was sworn in, now under the authority of opposition lawmaker Luis Parra, who belongs to the right-wing Primero Justicia Party. But once again, violence erupted, hoping to stop the session. Here they all think they own the truth and that they have the right to end your political career. We came here with a democratic alternative to ask the assembly to stop confrontations where nobody can win. Suddenly, Juan Guaidó decided it was time to come in by disregarding security and ignoring their earlier permission for him to go in. He tried to jump a fence. Juan Guaidó had a perverse strategy to come in with those invalidated lawmakers and break them. He knew he didn't have no votes to be reelected, and we suspected they wouldn't mount such a circus. In the end, Juan Guaidó led an illegitimate session in the office of a right-wing media outlet and once again self-proclaimed as the president of Venezuela and also as the president of the National Assembly. But now, the National Assembly has a leadership that, while still from their opposition, has a vision to coexist with the government. Their first goal is to lift the order of contempt the institution has been put under since 2017. Venezuela's national ta uh, dialogue table, which includes a small opposition parties and the Venezuelan government, has recognized the new presidency of the National Assembly as appointed within the legislative chamber on Sunday. In statements to the media leader of the Hope for Change party, Javier Bertucci, said that the ongoing dialogue seeks to provide answers to the country rather than meddle in games related to the destabilization of the country. Bertucci said that with this new group of lawmakers leading the National Assembly, they hope that people will put aside egos and work for the country and ensure that a new uh, National Electoral Council is appointed so that elections can be held. He also said that more members of the opposition would be soon released from incarceration as part of the agreements reached in talks with the PSUV government. One of the conditions and guarantees that has been discussed in the dialogue table is the appointment of a new National Electoral Council and also to validate all of the suspended political parties. We are here on behalf of all the opposition political parties who want to participate in the upcoming parliamentary elections. We want an equal... Millions of Iranians have come out to take part in a funeral procession for the late commander Qasem Soleimani. Tehran was brought to a standstill as citizens paid their respects to the leader who was killed in a U.S. drone strike in Iraq last week. During the funeral ceremony, his daughter Zainab Soleimani warned the United States and Israel of dark days ahead. Iran's leaders have vowed revenge for the assassination of a man who many see as a hero for his fight against terrorist groups. American Zionist powers should know that the martyrdom of my father caused more awakening of people in the resistance front and will bring back dark days to them and will make their fragile foundations collapse. Stupid Trump, a symbol of a stupidity and a toy in the hand of Zionism. Don't think that with the martyrdom of my father, everything is over. 
Meanwhile, U.S. President Donald Trump has doubled down on threats to target 52 Iranian sites, including cultural ones, if the Persian nation retaliates for the assassination of General Soleimani. Such a move would be a war crime under international laws, but President Trump said there that he uh, was undeterred. He also vowed to impose sanctions on Iraq if the country evicts U.S. military personnel. And the Council on American-Islamic Relations has said more than 60 Iranians and Iranian-Americans were detained for hours at Washington's state's border with Canada over the weekend. Those detained said their passports were confiscated and they were questioned about their political views for hours. Wafika Ibrahim from Telesur's sister channel Al Mayadeen has more from Beirut. Young people, especially in Iran, have come out in huge numbers to take part in the funeral processions for General Qasem Soleimani. This is very significant in Iran, and their sea of red flags are the symbol of revenge. Usually you see the black flags of mourning at funeral events, but this time it is different. The emotion and sadness of the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei when he led the funeral prayers was very clear. He broke down in tears for the martyr Soleimani more than once in the ceremony. All the estimates suggest that at least four or five million people took part in these funeral events. This is without precedent. Nobody expected that many. In fact, some people are describing what is happening now in Iran in this year 2020 as a second revolution, after the revolution that overthrew the Shah in 1979. The route of the procession stretched 10 kilometers, and all this area and all the access roads to it were simply packed with people. Soleimani's daughter, Zeynab, gave a speech in the University of Tehran and said that revenge for the blood of these martyrs is inevitable. She is known in her own right as an activist, and she said that the huge crowds that have turned out in Iraq and Iran sent a clear message to the United States that the organizations of the resistance really can defeat the enemy. Zeynab told the President Trump that his attempts to sow division between the people of Iraq and the people of Iran have failed, and that his actions have only cemented the unity of both peoples, and has only increased their hatred of imperialism and its policies. On Sunday, Iraqi lawmakers voted in favor of a motion calling for the expulsion of U.S. troops and all other foreign forces from the country. The vote came in response to the murder of General Soleimani, his close Iraqi associate, Abu Mahdi al-Muhandi, and eight others at Baghdad's International Airport on Friday. The motion calls for the annulment of a 2014 resolution that allowed the U.S. to send thousands of troops to Iraq to allegedly fight the Islamic State group. Following the Iraqi parliament's vote, militia commander Qais al Qasali said that if U.S. troops do not leave Iraq, they would be considered an occupying force. We, and I am speaking on behalf of the Iraqi resistance fighters, will never be quiet on any day regarding your occupation. And we will not be quiet regarding the crime of killing our leaders and brothers on our land while they are doing their duty in protecting our people. We will not be quiet when Iraqi blood is insulted and undermined. And we will not be quiet regarding the violations of our sovereignty and dignity. The Iraqi parliament has spoken, and now your troops should leave immediately. If your troops do not leave, or even if they delay themselves, they will be considered an occupying force and will be treated accordingly. Now for some news in Africa, Uganda's main opposition leader has been arrested. Singer-turned-politician Bobby Wine was arrested for allegedly holding an illegal public meeting. Ugandan law requires candidates for public office to introduce themselves to the Electoral Commission and to notify local authorities of events planned in their areas. Police fired tear gas to disperse his supporters who were protesting his arrest. He was scheduled to begin a series of consultations ahead of the 2021 presidential poll. 
Fresh uh, protests against the government have erupted in Liberia. Hundreds rallied in the capital, Monrovia, to protest against the country's president, George Weah, whom they have accused of corruption and abuse of power. These protests mark the third anti-government demonstration since the former football star took over as president in 2018. In Zimbabwe, the vice president's wife has been granted bail after three weeks in custody. The country's high court ordered Mari Chiwenga to pay a $50,000 bill. She was arrested last month on charges which include attempting to murder her husband, Vice President Constantino Chiwenga, as well as money laundering and fraud. The South African Communist Party has celebrated the 25th annual Joe Slovo commemoration. The celebration honors the party's key founder, Joe Slovo, who worked along with the late Nelson Mandela to fight apartheid in South Africa. The party is a key ally of the ruling party, the African National Congress, and has been vocal against the U.S. blocking on Cuba, Venezuela, and a number of African countries. Part of the team that drafted one of our most important programs of the SACP, the South African Road to Socialism, adopted in the underground Congress here, SACP, here in Gauteng, in 1962. Also, Comrade Joslovo participated in the drafting of the first strategy and tactics of the ANC, which was adopted in Morocco, in Tanzania, in 1969. And of course, wrote that wonderful document in 1988, the South African Working Class and the National Democratic Revolution. Now, this document of 1988, comrades who like to read must go back and read it again. It's one of the most important documents of our party because it was seeking to give guidance to the party and the working class at the height of the mass struggles against the apartheid regime in the 1980s. It's if Welcome back to From the South. Forces of Libyan strongman Khalifa Aftar have taken control of the site of Sirte, of the city of Sirt, from forces loyal to the UN-backed government of national accord. A spokesperson for Aftar's so-called Libyan National Army said large sections of the city located east of Tripoli are now under the control of his fighters. The city has been under the control of the GNA, GNA since 2016. In April, Aftar launched a military offensive to wrestle the control of Sirt and the capital, Tripoli, from the GNA. Today, Yemen is to the streets to condemn and promise to avenge this crime against the entire Islamic nation, not only against its Iranian and Iraqi leaders. Meanwhile, the UN Secretary General Special Representative for Libya, Ghassan Salome, has a charge that foreign interference is worsening the conflict in the North African country. Ghassan has since appealed to all foreign sectors to stop providing weapons and mercenaries to the warring sides. Uh, Turkey's parliament last week approved the deployment of troops to Libya to help the government of national accord to fend off an offensive by Aftar's forces. What's your message Take to your Iran? hands out of Libya. The country is suffering too much from foreign interference in different ways. In arms being sold to Libyans, in arms being given to Libyans, in direct foreign military action in Libya, in uh, looking for bases, permanent bases in Libya, in uh, all these kind of direct intervention is making things extremely difficult.
French lawyers have joined massive demonstrations against the proposed pension reform. Hundreds of lawyers demonstrated outside a courthouse in Marseille expressing their anger against the French government. They call the reforms unfair, warning that this move could lead to the closure of a number of small firms. Solidarity is something that's written in our ethics as lawyers. We are here to work for society, and even our pension plan does so, since we pay back a portion of what we managed to earn. Today, our own plan is well managed. If we were given guarantees, perhaps we could discuss them. But today, there is no discussion. And in Paris, the public transport strike has entered its 33rd day. On Monday morning, metro stations were packed with commuters heading back to work after the holidays. While a number of passengers expressed frustration at the ongoing strike, many others stand in solidarity against the neoliberal reforms of President Emmanuel Macron. Yes, I think it's worth it because from what I understand, we are going to work a lot longer to earn a lot less. And the people who want us to get through this are pretty privileged people who apparently are not going to have a point-based retirement. So I think this is worth fighting for. Firefighters continue to battle catastrophic flames that have caused extensive damage across southern Australia, leaving 24 people dead. These are images from the cockpit of a Royal Australia Air Force plane during a mission on Saturday as they try to help rescue those stranded by the bushfires. Hundreds of properties have been destroyed while seaside towns have been plunged into darkness after rains saw smoke blanket rural communities and major cities. The bushfires have been ongoing for months now with the researchers estimating that half a billion animals had been killed. The Australian government has announced an extra $2 billion to be allocated over the next two years towards rebuilding efforts after the destruction caused by massive bushfires. So the $2 billion commitment is an additional commitment. It is an additional cost. Um, it is an initial commitment. And if further funds are required, further funds will be provided. What we are focusing on here is the human cost and uh, the rebuilding cost for people's lives. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at tele